afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. This is the week of the spring meetings of the IMF and World Bank, the G20, and therefore it is also our third annual macro week here at the Peterson Institute. We're thrilled to have a exciting program of policymakers and thinkers from around the world coming to speak to us, and we are starting off macro week this year with one of the most important voices and most thoughtful policymakers I know, uh, Lesetia Kagak, I do it every time, Ganyago, governor of the South African Reserve Bank. Uh, he's very tolerant of my mispronunciation. Um, Lesetia Kanyago gave the Niarcos lecture here at the Peterson Institute previously. Uh, we are fans and admirers of him and his team at the bank and their work. Importantly, um, Lesetia was also the chairperson of the International Monetary and Financial Committee, which is the primary advisory board to the International Monetary Fund Board of Governors from January 2018 to January 2021. And he remains a respected and influential voice in the discussions around the IMFC, the G20, and the international system. He was appointed to be governor of the South African Reserve Bank in November 2014 and was reappointed for a second five-year term in November 2019. So we can look forward to him being in office at least another 18 months, possibly longer. Prior to his appointment as governor, he served as deputy governor of the bank from 2011. In addition to his role nationally in South Africa and as a former chair of the IMFC, he chairs the Committee of Central Bank Governors of the Southern African Development Community and importantly co-chairs the Financial Stability Board's regional consultative group for Sub-Saharan Africa and chairs the Financial Stability Board's Standing Committee on Standards Implementation. He has an ongoing interest in payments issues globally as well. Um, today, the governor is going to be speaking to us about the globalized stagflation and the emerging market response, the obsessions of the Americans and others with their own economies can always use a reality check and a broadening of perspective, and we're grateful to have Governor Kiganyago here to give us that today. Governor, if I may call you to the stage. Thank you very much, uh, Adam, for, uh, for that introduction. And uh, it's always good to, uh, to be at the Peterson Institute. And uh, I was just indicating that uh, most of the time I am here, I am here to work. Um, so uh, it's a great pleasure to be, uh, to be back uh, here. So while the advanced economies dominate the, the, the news, and I want to, to speak today about how the global inflation problem impacts emerging market uh, economies and South Africa specifically. A broad spectrum of emerging uh, economies are experiencing inflation rates that are persistent and well above targets. And yet, five years ago, many emerging and developing economies seemed, as a, or seemed to be on a steady path towards lower and more stable uh, inflation. Question, are emerging market economies able to get back onto that path given the challenges presented by the current global environment? Well, the short answer uh, to this must be yes, but we need to recognize that doing so will not be easy. Certainly, the headwinds to uh, constructive policy making have increased and global conditions are far from benign. The surge in global inflation and the many accompanying structural changes risk pushing emerging economies away from better policies. I believe there are some grounds for optimism uh, despite the headwinds. In particular, we can build on the experience we have gained in emerging market central banking and monetary policy in addressing stagflation. A key lesson from our collective experience has to do with how central banks 
can use transparency to improve the effectiveness of monetary policy. For advanced economies, arguably, the stagflation challenge demands better communication and clarity of policy. For emerging economies, many of which move faster to tighten policy, moved faster to tighten policy, central bank transparency can play a role in setting the tone for public policy more broadly, helping to ease or resolve our particular non-monetary constraints to better inflation outcomes. The South African approach has been to speak clearly to the monetary policy challenges we face and to highlight the constraints to better results, even if these lie outside the immediate span of monetary policy. This has not won us many friends, but it has helped to foster a better public discussion about the challenges holding back our economy. I want to spend some time today discussing the shift in global inflation from one paradigm to another, and then discuss how these challenges impact policy making in emerging economies with particular reference, of course, to South Africa. Let me touch on the genesis of the global inflation shock. In late 2019, before the COVID-19 pandemic, inflation was expected to remain low or even fall further. In October 2019, the IMF forecast inflation of 2% for the advanced economies and 4.3% for emerging and developing economies. For the latter group of countries, this was more than two percentage points below the average of the previous decade. The COVID-19 shock reinforced expectations of more disinflation and short-term inflation projections duly fell, alongside market-based measures of inflation expectations. Within two years, advanced economies experienced their highest inflation rates in decades, and very few emerging countries, with the notable ex exception of China, were left unscathed. Inflation has become both more persistent and broad-based. Whether you look at the common component of individual price patterns or at diffusion indices. So, what happened? With hindsight, we know that the worldwide lockdowns and staggered reopenings that followed, general, generated, that followed generated multiple supply demand mismatches. Complex supply chains only proved as resilient as their weakest link, resulting in bottlenecks and rising delivery lags. Disruptions to global trade were uh, indeed global and actually dramatic. Restrictions on activity persisted in and demand rotated towards consumer uh, goods, a surprise that quickly depleted industrial and retail inventories. The reopening was long and drawn out. Firms struggled to rehire employees, laid off months earlier, and labor force participation plummeted, eventually causing widespread labor shortages. Given this turmoil in the global economy, the Russian invasion of Ukraine was sure to royal markets and supply chains further, as unhelpful and tragic as it was incomprehensible. Not all of these developments were outside the purview of policymakers. As the consensus saw risk skewed towards disinflation at the start of the pandemic, so policymakers responded forcefully to the shock. Policy rates were slashed, often to zero. Central banks, including some emerging countries, purchased fixed income securities. Governments boosted cash transfers to households and firms. Policymakers also drew lessons from the period following the global financial crisis 
and kept stimuli in place well after economies have reopened. The impact on demand was massive, and with supply still constrained, it compounded the growing inflation problem. With hindsight, this was a policy error. These policy responses also exacerbated the de demand supply imbalances in labor market, adding another channel for inflation pressures. Ample cash transfers allowed many workers to pick and choose from uh, offers, while hybrid work changed the geographical distribution of labor supply. At a time when uh, shifting spending patterns altered the demand for labor, mismatches grew, putting upward pressure on wages. Perhaps the highest single problem had to do with how all this stimulus was positioned as new policy that would be kept in place for an extended time. In central bank lingo, forward guidance. I would characterize this as an adverse unintended consequence of policy commitment and credibility providing more certainty to markets than was possible. We central bankers positioned shifts in stance too often and fully as policy change at the wrong time. When we overdraw these changes, our ability to change direction is compromised. When the data further puts our commitment into question, we get sharply higher uncertainty and volatility. As we stand now, some of the supply demand mismatches I just described have abated. Natural gas prices are back near pre-war levels. Global prices of food commodities have declined and shipping costs normalized. Supply bottlenecks have eased and delivery lags are again in line with historical norms. Yet, not all imbalances have been resolved. Three years into the pandemic, uh, since the pandemic started, labor markets remain tight with unusually high levels of vacancies relative to how unemployment levels, relative to low unemployment levels. Furthermore, while year-on-year -year rates of inflation have peaked in most economies, the latest readings in major uh, countries have shown stronger short-term momentum in consumer prices. Services prices and core goods prices are either sticky or have reaccelerated, and with wages continuing to rise, the inflation problem is more complex today. This places existing forecasting and macroeconomic models at serious risk of underperforming. Outdated uh, data in both advanced and, uh, and de developing economies is one challenge. Another is simply the sharp rise in uncertainty and how it impacts on important model variables like inflation expectations. As Lord Mervyn King observed, given the uncertainty, the model assumption that inflation expectations remain anchored to target is too strong an assumption. To complicate matters, our ability to derive useful conclusions from short-term data also requires humility. Short-term elasticities can be assumed to be in flux. But in what way? Is, for example, the pass-through of energy costs to final consumer prices stronger? Is it faster or more or less symmetric today than yesterday? Will falling energy prices have a measurable effect on wages that are rising for structural reasons? These are questions that central bankers are confronted with. 
uh, for which I do not necessarily have an answer either. Our models tell us that declining real income significantly counters a surge in inflation. But the labor market behavior causing that outcome has very likely changed. Economic policies and structural factors suggest stronger responses of nominal wages to inflation. Are the implied changes to our Phillips curves permanent or do we need to adjust to non-linearities and more microeconomic ways of analyzing labor supply? Companies' profit margins have also increased, suggesting greater capacity of firms to pass through cost to consumers. Various explanations for this have been posited, some less influenced by economics, but we can get to firm conclusions about, the, about this. It seems useful to sort through the interactions between the many short-term demand and supply forces simultaneously affected by lockdowns, supply constraints, and technological change. It may also be the case that a switch has been flipped. The price formation process has become dynamically less benign as the Bank for International Settlements last year pointed out in a paper on regime shifts, asking us to look under the wood. Rather than understanding consumer prices as fading reflection of relative price shocks, they may co-move in self-reinforcing ways. Less a wave in a pond and more a tsunami building up as it gathers energy. I'm also not sure that we can simply say that labor market cost pressures are primarily a result of labor force participation rates that fell with the pandemic and will now rise again and thus easing wages. A case would be made that the drawing in of elderly workers in the pre-pandemic period reflected high demand and a shift away from a preference for leisure because for various reasons, returns to work had risen and returns to savings had fallen alongside other kinds of factors. As I turn to central bank uh, policy more directly, our inflation dynamics discussion also suggests that we may need to unlearn some lessons about cyclical policy from the global financial crisis period. Rising debt with inflation and interest rates weakens the utility of fiscal and monetary policy expansion to address any source of slowing growth. This idea of policy inefficiency is a mainstay of emerging market policy thinking, but less commonly articulated in the advanced economies. This is not to say that central banks could have or should have stepped back from action in the pandemic but it does prompt consideration of challenges to central bank policy in the wake of the pandemic. Let me now turn to the inefficiencies in policy transmission and new trade-offs we should consider. As inflation increased, central banks withdrew the stimulative policies put in place during the pandemic. However, it is less clear that we are now in unambiguously tight policy territory. Real rate levels are barely positive and still negative in much of the world. And easing inflation acts as less of a drag on economic activity. When we turn to nominal rates, we see the are uh, acting on credit demand, in particular in important markets like housing. But their effects are less obvious in others, in part because of structural developments and more persistent relative price shocks stemming from climate change, technology, and now geopolitics. 
clarity is further undermined by the high degree of focused uncertainty and the role of the unobservables. With so many structural changes occurring, potential GDP and neutral real interest rates are moving around. Such shocks will tend to muddy our sense of policy effectiveness and how we react in this environment. The possibility of over-tightening is clearly real. But central banks can also rectify their stance more quickly than in the event where they under-tighten. At this point in my story, it becomes hard to dodge the problems associated with financial institutions and financial stability more broadly. While more central most central banks will move quickly to cordon off financial stability concerns from monetary policy where a trade-off emerges, the neatness of this will always be suspect. There will always be a more or less constant second guessing of the monetary policy stance where tightening needs to happen leading to market volatility. More fundamentally, does the existence of such a trade-off undermine price stability? If our financial regulatory requirements imply savers deposits and investments at banks are at risk from market repricing, then do central banks have to permanently socialize losses just to keep the financial sector turning over? And with what long-term implications with respect to central bank finance, relationships with national treasuries, and ultimately central bank independence? Let me now turn to the situation of emerging economies. In a globalized world with long value claims, long value chains, Factors such as energy prices and shipping costs, shortages of semiconductors or storage capacity will affect a broad set of prices in many countries. Integration in global food markets impacts local food prices. Gl common global factors such as food and energy also increasingly determine services prices. As the US dollar has strengthened, the inflationary impact of currency depreciation has resurfaced, a result of the reduced appetite for risk and the relative attractiveness of emerging market assets. As global price pressures rose, inflation expectations also increased, reflecting our local propensity to stagflation. However, not every emerging market central bank faced the same price pressures now needed to respond to the same, uh, in the same fashion. If we compare the response of monetary policy in South Africa to that of its emerging market peers, we see that it falls somewhere in the middle. Our policy rate currently stands at 7.75%, representing a cumulative increase of 425 basis points since we beg, began raising rates in November 2021, compared to the policy easing of 300 basis points in 2020 in response to the pandemic. Our inflation rate is 7%, or 5.2% when excluding food, fuel, and electricity. While both rates are still above the midpoint of our 3 to 6% target range, Headline inflation is off its highs of a few months ago and compares favorably to our emerging market peers. Several factors probably explain why South Africa did not experience the same acceleration in prices as many other countries. The first factor had to do with the fact that Budgetary stimulus in 2020 was relatively guarded, and successive budgets have strived for a primary surplus. 
Secondly, South Africa's inflation target credibility helped to dampen the initial waves of global inflation, keeping inflation expectations muted for some time. Third, the depth of our domestic capital markets has limited exposure to swings in hard currency interest rates, while South Africa's net international investment position has remained positive in rent terms, suggesting little needed change in what is a beneficial level of international financial integration. Alongside a current account surplus from a robust terms of trade, relatively low levels of external and foreign currency denominated debt, the currency played its role as an automatic stabilizer without triggering financial concerns. So, what are the implications for policy going forward? With relative real policy rates and with negative real policy rates and the accompanying commodity price boom, a large part, part of our recovery was demand driven. The terms of trade, fiscal expansion, and the lower borrowing costs were nonetheless offset in part by higher household and corporate savings. Alongside very low potential growth, a function of energy constraints primarily, the output gap has been much smaller than expected and measured to be zero in recent quarters. The weak growth performance entails further risks in a world where globalization is retreating with real yields propped up by higher borrowing demands and insufficient efforts to get growth moving. South Africa and other emerging markets need to work harder to attract capital. This is even more true in a world in which neutral real rates in advanced economies shift higher, a prospect that looks increasingly likely. In such conditions, emerging market uh, economies run a serious risk of becoming permanently more prone to currency depreciation and higher inflation. On its own, this prospect pulls up our neutral rates and can only be combated with more orthodox policy measures. Clarity in South Africa, clearly in South Africa, Structural reforms and, a key, and key deregulations of transport and electricity are critical. But so too is a, sh a shift in fiscal policy back to pre predictable, transparent rules. With the rise in debt created by our efforts to confront weakening growth and failures of state enterprises, there is little chance of improving credit quality without new rules and more strategic use of macroeconomic policy. A major benefit to fiscal policy and to stronger growth would be the implementation of a revised inflation target in South Africa. A lower target sitting at, say, 3% would help dampen rate volatility and sovereign risk, reduce the potential for upward drift in, a real, interest rate, in a real exchange rate, and materially lower debt service costs primarily for the now over indebted public sector. Let me draw this to conclusion and say, we look forward to further easing in global inflation and falling inflation expectations, in particular in emerging economies where they have ratcheted higher, higher over the past year. Compared to the high inflation era of the 1970s, central bankers are probably better equipped to deal with the problem. We have a better understanding of the role of expectation in shaping price patterns and of the relative importance of supply versus demand factors, as well as better statistical tools to measure them. The inflation targeting framework now in, uh, used by most uh, central banks have provided a more solid anchor than the more ad hoc approaches of those earlier high inflation decades. 
However, complacency is a subtle enemy in this particular policy effort. It is true that central bankers are better able to address inflation should it stay high, but doing so effectively requires much greater fiscal complementarity and for good communication to play a critical role in keeping expectations in check. From the side of central banks, the policy challenge in communications should be achievable even though credibility in the market has deteriorated. I am less sanguine about policy coordination, particularly with fiscal authorities, when demands on the public pairs are so high and some long-term costs such as from financial bailouts remain hidden from view. Should coordination take place, the institutional setup should be such that the remit of each of the authorities is clearly spelled out and accountability maintained. Perhaps the weakest link in our analytical and policy frameworks remains our ability to identify, measure, and adjust to structural changes such as climate changes, demographics and labor markets, technology and trade. These drive relative price adjustments and create persistence in inflation, but defy easy analysis. Central banks globally need to have more respect for these determinants of inflation, and advanced economies should consider taking greater comfort from minor recessions instead of prolonged periods of weak growth that bedevil larger emerging markets like mine. Together, cyclical and ongoing structural forces will present a rich and varied set of topics for central banks to focus on in coming years. Let us ensure we remain up for the challenge. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Governor Kiyanyago. That was great. Um, as a central bank junkie, uh, in particular, your skillful weaving of criticism, well-founded, and lessons flowing or should be flowing from emerging markets to high-income central banks was very profound. As I mentioned, I particularly appreciated your remarks about the foibles of forward guidance of treating adaptation to current circumstances as though it's a major policy shift or even regime shift. Before we turn to some of those broader issues, though, I would like to ask you to say a bit more about how emerging markets like South Africa have and should adapt to these external inflation shocks that we're seeing, whether they come from US overheating or from Russian invasion of Ukraine and energy markets. In particular, um, you made very little mention of uh, exchange rate management, issues of capital flows. You mentioned that for South Africa, you feel the exchange rate acted the way it should be as a uh, automatic stabilizer almost. Um, don't worry, I'm not gonna go on forever, just one more line. Um, we were fortunate, thanks to our colleagues, Doug Irwin and Maury Obsfeld, to hold a conference here a week ago, just over a week ago, on the 50th anniversary of floating exchange rates. Um, and so, in a sense, what you're saying is a great argument that that was the right move. Meanwhile, the IMF has their new, what do they call it, enhanced framework, or which seems to say, well, maybe capital f flow controls aren't so bad. So if you could just say a bit more about when and how you think emerging markets benefit from the float versus having to intervene in these kinds of circumstances. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Adam. Um, I, always, I already thought that I had a lot to say about uh, yes. other things, which is why I didn't talk about yes. this uh, um, uh, 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 two areas. Uh, 
the thing about how emerging markets adapt to these inflation shocks, I, I, I don't know of others, but uh, for us in South Africa, uh, and I'm sure it might be true for the others too, dealing with inflation in a small open economy necessarily means that you always have to deal with big shocks. And whether these shocks emanate from the advanced economies through tightening of financial uh, uh, conditions or aggressive loosening of financial uh, conditions, um, uh, those who were engaged in the debates in uh, 2009 and 2010 will remember the Brazilian finance minister almost characterized quantitative uh, easing as currency wars. Right. And, um, and we have learned, we have always had, had to deal uh, with, this, uh, with these shocks. And I can say to you that in the case of South Africa for a period of three to five years, we had had to spend time explaining that we have experienced shocks. And as a matter of course, we try to look through the shocks and only respond to second round effects of those shocks. The problem is when you have got a multiplicity of shocks, because now it's difficult to see through them and they become self-reinforcing and the more persistent they are and the less temporary they are, the more they start to fit through into uh, inflation expectations and price, uh, uh, and price formations. And in a way, uh, when I looked at South Africa's uh, case in the aftermath of all of uh, these shocks, the earlier part uh, showed that inflation was contained, core remained uh, closer or even below the midpoint of our inflation uh, target range. But as these shocks persisted over a period of two years, we saw inflation starting to feed uh, into, uh, into core. And... Um, you know, we would try to attach science to this, but there is more art than there is science uh, uh, to this. Because by the time you come to realize that the shocks are persistent, it might be too late. And we end up having to act on the basis of incomplete information. And part of the reason why I post questions in the manner I post without answering them was to say that, well, we grapple with this all the time and we might not necessarily uh, be, be having the, answer, uh, the, the, the answers. So, if there is adaptation, maybe adaptation might have to come from advanced economies because how often do you guys in advanced economies deal with these shocks? We deal with the shocks all the time as small open uh, economies. It's the, as a central banker, that is what you've got to be uh, learning uh, uh, to do. Managing demand is uh, fairly straightforward and takes textbookish, but dealing with the supply shocks is the challenge that emerging market central banks deal with all the time. Well, that's, that's great. Um, the, you also mentioned one of the sections of your speech is titled Inefficiencies in Policy Transmission and New Trade-Offs. So one of the things that, two things have been striking this cycle compared to some past Fed tightening cycles are first, that the Fed has not had as much traction, it seems, on the real economy uh, as previous rounds where they raised 500 basis points. Um, the SVB crisis sort of clouded that, but as of three or four weeks ago, that was the topic. And at the same time, South Africa, Brazil, Mexico, Indonesia, India, a number of the major emerging markets that, in a sense, as you point out, got out ahead on monetary policy, they also seem to have been less affected in terms of credit cycle or growth by Fed tightening than the past. First, just going back to what you said in your speech, am I exaggerating this or do you think this is a real phenomenon that policy transmission from the Fed, both domestically and internationally, is diminished. And second, again, in the same spirit of art and adapting to shocks, how, how, how do you think we should take that into account? 
Um, th thanks. Um, I think that uh, I would be less qualified to talk about the transmission in the uh, U.S. Sure. context. Sure. Um, what I do know is that uh, you guys have uh, uh, fixed mortgages. Uh, that in itself contains the uh, transmission. Uh, in our case, we have got floating uh, mortgages. So that credit channel works fairly, uh, fairly well. Uh, but the transmission into uh, the other real economic activity is what we are having to grapple with. Um, do the parameters that we had in the past, do they, do they still hold? For a long time um, in South Africa, we had thought of monetary policy transmission being an 18 to 24 months at a time. We think that it is now, uh, it is now shorter. But the effect, the transmission of the Fed policy to the emerging market economies becomes uh, more important. And actually, in the case of South Africa, we actually think that the South African economy most responds more to changes in U.S. monetary policy rather than changes in real economic uh, activity. We are a small uh, open uh, economy. But this links up to the question that you first posed and which you went past, which has to do with exchange rate, uh, exchange rate management. We had had episodes in the past where we tried to manage the exchange rate. And we had foreign exchange traders in the central bank who thought that they are particularly clever <laughs> and that they could do better than uh, uh, the market. Uh, we didn't have to tell them to learn about humility. They came second best <laughs> and cost the country a lot of money because the nature of the intervention was such that they had to write a lot of swaps and forwards, uh, which they got the best wrong. And as a result of that, the central bank made massive losses. And unfortunately, uh, in our setup, those losses are for the account of the treasury and that meant that the treasury had to take care of that and it was not a, a good experience so we changed the monetary policy anchor from where we looked at everything and it coincided with us introducing inflation targeting and we had to accept as a small open economy the other one variable we do not control is the exchange rate I know there are some of our emerging market peers, mainly in Asia, with massive foreign exchange reserves, and they can take this to some uh, extent. But it is a policy option we do not have. Our reserves are uh, pretty modest. And then you talked about the capital uh, flow measures, and I could only say to the IMF, uh, welcome back. Uh, because emerging market economies had had to deal uh, uh, with uh, capital flow measures. Uh, but in the case of South Africa, our approach had been that we had been liberalizing our capital account and we, in terms of paradigm shift, we were moving from an environment where you have a uh, controlled capital account with a few exceptions to one where we have got a free capital uh, movement of capital with a few, uh, with a few exceptions. And so we have been reluctant to utilize uh, capital flow measures because partly part of it had been that the exchange rate has actually done such a good job for us uh, in absorbing uh, the shocks, both negative and positive. Thank you. That's really interesting. I'll just um, ask one more question, if necessary, too. We have the governor till roughly 1.20 before he needs to get to his official meetings. If anybody in the audience would like to ask a question, please go to the, the standing mic in back if we can trouble you to do that. Um, one more question, sort of more harking back to your global role and your past service leading the IMFC. Um, your neighbor, Zambia, seems to be getting quite caught in uh, China-U.S. frictions and issues of debt right now. You may not want to comment specifically on the Zambian situation, but more broadly, what would you like to see from the G20 or from the IMFC in the face of the current debt problems in Africa and elsewhere? 
Um, yes, I mean, uh, the current debt episode uh, is fundamentally different from the previous one. Uh, previously, you had the uh, official uh, creditors, and you could just convene in the Paris lab or talk to the IMF and the World Bank and deal with uh, uh, with those uh, uh, with those issues. It is complex now because you also have non-Paris lab uh, creditors. Thirdly, is that there is something that had baffled me, uh, at least from what I have seen on the African continent. I could understand how people could hide assets. I do not understand how people hide debt. Because at some point, somebody will say, you owe me, you have got to pay. And part of having to deal with this resolution, and this is where the common framework had found, had to deal with debt transparency. Right. And in, the, in our case in South Africa, our constitution demands full transparency. And actually, the National Treasury has to publish not just a debt figures, they also have to publish any guarantees that the government has so that everybody knows what is going on. Parliament had asked that uh, the National Treasury publish this more regularly, and I think they do it about uh, quarterly uh, now. And that brings in uh, the transparency. The fourth complication in the current debt uh, situation has to do with uh, privately held uh, a debt, uh, which uh, means that, uh, I mean, I think those who participate in the IIF for a long time, we had the IIF's uh, principles of fair debt restructuring. And we sort of like used that and you could go through, uh, 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 through those. But then the complexity once again of uh, the privately held debt had to do then with also domestic debt. And the domestic debt in many of these countries also interlinked with nascent pension fund industries and uh, the banking system. And so when you talk of haircuts um, in this uh, framework, or you're talking about some debt write-off, you have got to, to be uh, cognizant of that. And lastly, to make it more complex, when I talked about uh, central bankers having uh, uh, long eyes and uh, whittling into things they shouldn't be whittling into, uh, some of the central banks uh, decided that they are going to do almost a QE and they had basically uh, monetized deficits and they are holding uh, the government bonds. And when you talk of having the haircut, you also have to haircut the central banks, which means that central banks themselves might have to be recapitalized. So it's a complex, uh, a complex, uh, a complex uh, um, uh, framework. But the common framework is what we have. Um, I think there are efficiencies to be realized there, and I think that we must just get and get it uh, uh, working. I think the process is just taking too long. You mentioned the case of Zambia. They have been at it for, uh, 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 for some time, and um, it's uh, uh, creating a lot of uncertainty and access issues for Zambia in terms of finance. Thank you. Uh, going to the back mic, if you could please identify yourself before yeah. asking your question. Yes, yeah, but there no, are people wait, online. There are people <laughs> online. There are many, many people online. Barry right Wood. Now. I write a column for the Daily Friend in Johannesburg. I want to ask you, Governor, about uh, the role of China in Africa. First of all, would there be advantages for South Africa using the renminbi in some of its trade, particularly with China? And secondly, how would you characterize the role of China in the debt restructurings and in the debt problems of your neighbors like Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Zambia? Yeah, uh, well, I sort of like uh, touched with it without uh, so far uh, um, uh, mentioning China. Suffice to say that with respect to uh, the debt, I think that uh, for the benefit of the audience, uh, South Africa does not have any uh, uh, China, China debt. Um, and I think that the issue with China debt in Africa had a lot to do with transparency. You had to know what debt is involved, what guarantees that, uh, are entailed, and they tend to be linked somehow to some important uh, 
a commodity, uh, it becomes a a, a complex a, a complex a, a complex issue. With respect to the uh, RMB, which then brings me to China, South Africa. China is a very important trading uh, a partner uh, for uh, for South Africa, um, just like the U.S. But the thing is that the trade between South Africa and uh, China becomes an interesting one. South Africa mainly sends commodities to China, and it gets uh, manufactured products from uh, from China of various uh, uh, of various forms. So the trade is uh, uh, is important. There is a Ren an, a Renminbi uh, uh, clearing center in uh, uh, in Johannesburg. Um, the South African Reserve Bank does have bilateral swap lines with uh, uh, with China. So if there is there are issues of constraints in the RMB rent uh, market. The two central banks can uh, help to facilitate uh, to facilitate that. Um, historically, the trade had tended to be settled in U.S. dollars. Uh, with the RMB uh, center, there is now an increasing uh, proportion that is also starting to be denominated in RMB and in rent, um, and that uh, that. Uh, 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 would be uh, uh, useful, but it became also easier once the RMB got incorporated in the SDR, uh, because then it was almost seen as a reserve currency, uh, so to say. We do also hold, as South Africa, a small proportion of our reserves uh, in uh, in RMB. Thank you. I'm afraid this is going to have to be the last question. Please. Thank you so much. Elena Rabakova with Peterson. I have a question about the domestic financial system. So South Africa is in a unique emerging market with the depth and the diversity of the domestic financial system. But are you also worried about the financial stability concerns, especially from SOEs, the domestic market, ESCOM, uh, on, on the, you know, for your monetary policy making inclusive, including? And then the sort of a follow-up second question is that there are emerging markets that say that, look, we're forced to use this um, the IMF's uh, special management measures, have, uh, integrated policy framework there, uh, because we don't have such deep domestic markets, we don't have the domestic uh, government debt market, and we're highly dependent on foreign investors. So what advice you would give them in terms of transitioning towards your system of the deep domestic uh, financial system and markets? Thank you. Um, let me start with the, uh, the issues of the, uh, the issues. The way in which we had thought about um, the debt position of the SOEs in South Africa had been twofold. The two major ones being ESCOM and Transnet. The issue is not their debt problem. The issue is their operational efficiencies. And it is their operational efficiencies that impact on their revenues and thus end up having the problems that uh, uh, they, are, uh, they are having. They have not posed a financial stability risks in terms of the actual uh, the actual debt. Um, the risk, the quality of risk management in the South African financial markets is top class, and um, and with respect to the banking industry, there we had imposed appropriate risk weights uh, to uh, the uh, to that uh, to that debt. It used to be easier for these uh, SOEs, but it is no longer uh, the case. Um, and to the extent that they are guaranteed um, by the central uh, government, by the national government, it leads us to another uh, question. How do we think about fiscal risks in the uh, determination or in, in the setting of, uh, uh, of monetary policy? And we had highlighted uh, this on a couple of occasions that um, we expect that government should restore the health of the South African uh, uh, fiscals, uh, because by so doing, it would make um, our job as the central bank uh, much easier, which is why I am sanguine about the coordination uh, in this uh, era, because the coordination would necessarily entail significant fiscal consolidation at the time that uh, the people tasked with these responsibilities would like to be 
dishing out goodies to the members of the uh, of the public, and that becomes uh, that becomes uh, uh, that becomes tricky. And so that is how we think about it. Uh, the thing about the advice that you know every country is uh, uh, is different, uh, and in a way, South Africa's capital markets uh, developed not yes. The, Post 1994, which is the, uh, the era of democracy, it was a conscious policy decision. But we had already inherited a financial market that was significantly developed compared to the other emerging uh, markets. And it had to do with the sanctions era. Uh, in, when South Africa had well, financial sanctions, it was forced to develop its own uh, domestic capital markets. And uh, I wouldn't advise the others to go that route because it also entailed significant financial repression because insurance companies and pension funds were compelled by law to hold the government uh, government debt in the form of prescribed uh, assets. And so, so, so you had that. But with confidence coming in 19, towards the transition to democracy, the prescribed assets were removed and Surprise, surprise that we actually had even more foreigners coming into our market uh, than we had uh, before. And that uh, uh, facilitated the further, the further development of uh, our domestic uh, capital market. And that had become uh, uh, fairly useful and almost like linking it back to what Adam had raised about the, trans, uh, the transmission of US policy to um, uh, emerging markets. And in our case, there is an an 85% correlation between the South African 10-year Treasury bond and the U.S. 10-year Treasury bond. So developments in the U.S. Treasury market have got almost an instant uh, transmission to uh, the South African bond market. Part of it has to do with the fact that 28% of our domestic um, bond is actually held by foreigners and it trades uh, all the time. And that is what uh, that is what we face. Let me cut it off there um, because the governor has to get to the official meetings. Um, Lesetja, thank you so much. This was substantive. Your leadership on issues of financial stability, on monetary policy, not just in your country but in many others, on Southern Africa as well as South Africa's challenges is wonderful. We're very privileged to have been able to host you here at the Peterson Institute to start our Macro Week 2023. Um, just a reminder that uh, today at 3 p.m. our second Macro Week event will be with Masato Kanda, the Vice Minister of Finance for International Affairs for Japan, another key G20 country. But first, this stands alone. Uh, Please join me in thanking Governor Lesetja Kikanyago, Governor of the South African Reserve Bank. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.